participating today. Extra thanks to to Robert uh, Giorti from uh, Air Canada, who uh, is uh, actually uh, offered that they that Air Canada hosts this presentation, and then we have uh, our uh, expert speaker Francis Leliberde from uh, who is the manager of the Airbus fleet for Air Canada. Uh, we will be recording uh, this uh, presentation, so we will uh, provide you the link uh, later. During the presentation, please uh, uh, raise your hand. We will try to monitor that as much as we can. However, feel free also to jump in if you have any questions. We plan to, to have uh, about 40 minutes, including Q&A with, uh, with Francis, and uh, then uh, we'll have a short uh, presentation from uh, Dragos, Dragos <coughs> Munteanu, who attended the, uh, the IASA meeting a few uh, days ago, and uh, Dragos Budeanu, who uh, will just give us uh, uh, some highlights. And also I have asked uh, uh, Bob Ireland from A4A if uh, uh, he can jump in. He's not on the schedule, but he may be able to provide some input uh, as he's also familiar with, uh, with the topic. So with this, uh, let's uh, jump quickly into the presentation. So Francis, it's all yours. And thanks again for doing this for the TechOps Working Group at, at IATA. We appreciate it. All yours. My pleasure, Chris. Uh, just before I start, so can you confirm you guys can hear me well? And I assume you see my screen as well? Yes, we can see your screen. Everything is good. Go. Super. All right. Thank you. So thanks, uh, thanks again, Chris, for the opportunity. Um, before, let me introduce myself. My name is Francis Laliberté. I'm the Airbus Fleet Manager at Air Canada. So I'm responsible on the maintenance side of all the reliability of the fleet. Uh, I guess Robert Gialti, also my uh, colleague from Air Canada, uh, volunteered me for this uh, presentation. Uh, <laughs> I've been working on this cabin air quality issue since we've been starting to be uh, heavily impacted back in 2018. So uh, I don't have the pretension to say I'm an expert. I'll just say that I've been through uh, uh, Ellen back on this uh, topic. So uh, yes, maybe I know a little bit, so I'm happy to share what, uh, what, how we've been affected and what are the key takeaways uh, from, this, from these situations Air Canada has taken. So, this is really what I want to present to the team this morning. So without any further ado, so let's uh, kick it off for the first slide. So uh, as, as I was saying, uh, Air Canada, we, were, we started to be really impacted starting in 2018. So uh, I started at Air Canada in 2016. I know before that we had some issues with an APU tie, but really the uh, uh, in Q3 of 2018, this is when things uh, got really heated. Uh, we had, as you can see, and this is starting from August until the end of the year, we had almost 100 events on the air, on our narrow body fleet. Uh, and we had no tools at our disposition to, um, to recognize the situation and to address it. Uh, we were using the AMM, which is not really well structured to perform troubleshooting identify source. So we were replacing APUs, we were replacing engines, uh, sometimes two engines, sometimes three engines on the same aircraft, one after the other. Uh, we had crews refusing aircraft uh, from their office uh, because they knew that aircraft had an event. So it was really a nightmare. So rapidly we understood that to be efficient, we needed to put a structure around this uh, to first be able to, once an event is reported, how do we handle it? So, uh, excuse me for a sec. And this is when, <coughs> sorry, starting in 2019, or let's say towards the end of 2018, we, we took the troubleshooting in hand. So we developed our own troubleshooting instead of using the AMM, which was very, it's complicated, uh, especially when an event lasts from one station and the aircraft transferred to another. Uh, it's hard to, to know when the troubleshooting has started and where it stopped. So, we decided to build our own task card to control the flow of troubleshooting. Uh, because the more events you get, the more educated you, you are about the issue. So we knew that certain areas were more prone 
uh, for leaks. So this is where we were uh, sending our AMEs to inspect, and we wanted we wanted them to make sure we were eliminating one root cause after the other, and really to have a methodic approach. And also this, uh, in 2019, this is also where we started to have some workshops with Airbus. Uh, so in fact, the first one was in December of 2018, where we presented the, um, so Airbus organized this, uh, uh, this uh, workshop with the North American operators. And they presented us that oh, cabin air quality events, this is uh, the number of events we've had, but we felt that they were really disconnected in terms of our experience and what information they were receiving. And anyone in that room, I don't know if there's anyone that were, that were there, but um, that, was, uh, that was quite an heated uh, session between the airlines and Airbus since the data that they were presenting was really not represent representative of how the airlines were affected. So I think this is where Airbus really understood the magnitude of the situation. And the Air Canada and other airlines, we understood that we were not alone in our situation. And this is really where we started to collaborate all together and really start to put some effective measures in place. Like I said, the troubleshooting instructions was one of them. Uh, we developed multiple iterations out of that, and that was based on uh, sharing information with other airlines. So cooperation was one of the key uh, elements into uh, uh, taking back control of those uh, call it smell and cabin events or cabin air quality events. So we had multiple workshops with Airbus uh, amongst operators, but also this is where we started to engage uh, discussions with the engine OEMs and the APU OEM because the oil comes from somewhere, it comes from the APU or the engine. I know sometimes in some of our meetings with them, they have a hard time to recognize that. They try to um, say the bleed system has an oil issue, but there's no bleed, there's no oil in the bleed or the air conditioning system. So we have to make sure they, they understood that. Um, so we see the, the really the rise from 2018, 2019 also was a, uh, was a heavy uh, impacted year, if I can say it like that. But we were starting to uh, identify the main root causes, put in place mitigating actions, work out on our troubleshooting instructions. We were, and then we also started to do some um, communication sessions with uh, our pilots group, with our uh, health and safety groups uh, in flight, our AMEs also. So I toured uh, our, our maintenance station to kind of go with our AMEs to educate them on the situation, the tools that we were putting in place, and also highlight them the, the main area where to look for. Um, 2020 with the pandemic, obviously this has helped given that at some point we only had 5% of our narrow body fleet that was in operation. So uh, yes, we had less aircraft in operation, but uh, nevertheless, this is where we, we really saw an inflection in the data, as you can see. But we, this is where the um, all the work of, in the previous years, we're, we're starting to see the, the the results from all of that work. However, we so we were kind of having wins on the 320 fleet, but we're seeing the 330 fleet now having more and more repeat events. So uh, we had we had a fleet of only eight aircraft. So um, when compared to over 100 aircraft with a narrow body fleet, so that so that's the ratio. So seeing those numbers is, is quite significant. <clears throat> but again, with all the knowledge we had gained from the 320 fleet, we were easily be, uh, able to transfer it. And uh, on the 330, uh, I won't dive into the root causes just now. I'll, I'll wait for in a couple of slides. But the, the root causes for the 330 were. Uh, in fact, the pandemic or the low utilization of the aircraft was one of the root causes. So, so you know, that's kind of skewed the data, but, uh, um, but again, so 2021 uh, with the 330s and 2022, I guess it's a never ending battle. We're still, having, we're, we're still having events here and there, but now we're really well structured, more prepared. And um, so in the next step, I'll go to the approach that we've taken. So one of them is obviously to identify the main root causes. So in this slide, I've, uh, I'm presenting you know, per ATA what have been the main root causes. Uh, 
I don't think it's a surprise for anyone. APU is number one by far. This is known. Uh, when you look at the uh, the main root causes for the APU back in 2019, when we first started to be uh, impacted with those uh, cabin air quality events, uh, the top three root causes were the load compressor seal, starter motor, and the LOP switch. I did the same exercise recently and looking at the, our top root causes again for the APU. And now the previous top three is no longer there. We, no, have, uh, we don't have issues with those elements anymore, but we have new raising issues. So the generator, the transfer tube seal, and the FCU seals, which back in 20, 2019 were maybe ranked at number six, seven, and eight. So the time and money that we've invested into putting in place the mitigating solutions has paid off. So this is again the approach that at Air Canada we 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 want to put forward is um, we want to invest our, our money and our time into fix into a preventive solution in uh, yeah, exactly. we want to invest our time and money into mitigating solutions other than uh, and I know you know there are some talks about installing devices in the aircraft to uh, to hide the odor or to uh, to detect, but you know, I have my you know I have some thoughts about it. But uh, this is really where we want to invest our time and money because it has proven to be successful. And if we eliminate the root causes one by one, we end up in a situation where we can control the event. Because what we don't want is to have repeat events. So once the event is uh, identified or reported by the crews. You want to make sure you uh, you nail it uh, right from the start. And I'll go through the troubleshooting uh, methodology right after. But so again, APU, the no fault found one. So so this one, this is where the communication with our flight crew team was uh, was a key. And our um, and ends troubleshooting with our mechanics also. This is where it, it has paid off over time. So the systems. Uh, 2016, this full uh, uh, set of data. So this has improved over time, but um, so there's a lot of NF no fault found events in there where the crews were are snagging things where we put the aircraft down, we inspect it, we run the APU, we run the engine, we have no finding. We put the aircraft back in service and there's no repeat event. So there's a lot of that in there. So talking with our crews saying, well, before you snag it, like make sure of this and that. Um, and also with our mechanics, we want to make sure we, you know, they, they go to the uh, key locations and use the right tool to, uh, to do the inspections. So we had some issues with the engines. Uh, AT5 here is all of the uh, glycol uh, or ground GSCs event. Um, in Canada, we do a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, de-icing. Uh, in the winter, uh, right now I have, in fact, I have two aircraft that are AOG due to a, a glycol uh, ingestion, which creates fume in the cabin. So, again, we're working with our flight ops team to put in procedure to make sure that after the icing, certain procedures are put in place. So, uh, well, given I have two aircraft AOG right now, we still have, we still need to work on that. Uh, AT25 will be all uh, all of the cabin events. 24 all of the electrical. So you see these ones are, are marginal, but again, you know, there are, there are some contributing uh, factors in that. So I don't know if there's any questions, I'll just uh, uh, press on, but again, if you have any uh, comments or questions, please don't hesitate. So Francis, if you allow me, uh, Drago Shayata, uh, two quick uh, ideas I want I would appreciate if you can uh, share some clarification on it. Um, I know that Air Canada is operating a sizable fleet of 787s, uh, so bleedless aircraft. Uh, do you notice the same trend in terms of events that are not linked to uh, engine bleed and APU bleed, like the ones uh, related to de-icing, uh, etc.? Thank you. Um, no. Not on the seven eight. Uh, again, the bleed doesn't come from the engine uh, or the APU. So I guess it's 
it's less prone to uh, the IC ingestion. I'm not too sure where the CAC at, uh, air inlets are, are located, but uh, but seven eight we don't hear about it. Uh, our max fleet as well, triple uh, seven, no issue with swimming cabin. We have some odd cases here and there. Most of the time, oil related on on those other fleets except uh, seven eight, but. Um, 220 fleet right now is uh, is kind of taking the lead in the number of uh, repeat events, and there are some uh, there are some uh, physical root causes with the EPUs and the engine. So this is another issue, but 220 is being uh, affected by the Swan cabin at the moment. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, seven eight uh, no 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 issue. Thank you. Perfect. One one more um, question from Christian or or Dragos, did yeah. you finish? Yes. Yes, um, Christian. Hi, hi. Just a comment uh, from my side. Um, um, uh, I think we are all suffering um, uh, from from this uh, this events and uh, what what we uh, invented uh, some years ago um, is a troubleshooting procedure where we we do a double check with an error tracer. Um, uh, so a run up with an error tracer if we have uh, um, the suspected oil spell by reported by the flight crews, which is somehow subjective, and doing a run up with an error tracer to uh, with with the same uh, with, with with the normal setup with all engines running, all beats running, and all packs running, and uh, if we have nothing nothing indicated there. Um, then we release the aircraft, and otherwise we go go a step forward and, and looking this, looking for the source which which um, um, got the error tracer to alarm for certain certain values like oil. Just a comment. Yeah. So Christian, right? So so thank you. And um, you are from the Tenza, if I'm if I'm right. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, and thank you for that. We um, we had some discussions with Lufthansa. We we tried the IRO tracer, and again, so what I'm sharing is Air Canada experience. I know we spoke with Thomas Cook uh, back then, and they, they were using the IRO tracer, and they, they had good success with it. Uh, I'm hearing good success on your side, but uh, on our side, we had the time the events where we tried to use it. We were not successful in, in the finding a root cause and whatnot. So um, so I'm not saying the tool is not, uh, I know it has worked for other airlines, but we had zero to, to no success on our side using Euro Tracer or, or we tried other uh, tools in that uh, doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, we've not been successful on, on that side. Yeah. I think it's not um, um, why I mentioned it. It's more the in direction to to the flight crews, where it's very emotional. If you have a peak on 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 uh, oil smell, everybody knows it. Uh, um, I think and and experience by themselves, you can neutralize it a little bit when you have a proper procedure how to release an airplane. Yeah, and we go so far if we oh. really um, uh, are not able to duplicate it, we do an additional um, um, check flight to release the aircraft. But normally the aero yeah. tracer is is a confirmation and it's I, I'm, I'm with you. It's not um, it's a, um, a super tool for troubleshooting. Their experience is much, much better. But um, in regards, uh, regards to the flight crews, it's a, it's a real good tool to release an aircraft after trouble. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What you said, I agree with you to kind of comfort the crew and get the level of confidence. Sometimes it takes something like that. So, so I agree with you. Uh, you know, um, so efficient troubleshooting, whether you you kind of you use an aero tracer or other sensing device in the end to kind of seal it off, or you, or on our side, I guess we gain back the confidence of our crews by. Um, proving them that our troubleshooting was working, uh, that we were able to identify the sources when there was one, and we were not finding a source when there was none, because we're showing with the data that once we were releasing the aircraft, there was no repeat. So, so and so, yeah, there was, but that's, a, that was, it was a process, a lot of work, a lot of discussions, great collaboration with our chief pilot and, and our uh, flight ops team, but, uh, but yeah, the, the Euro Tracer is, uh, is something worth, worth trying out. So I guess that's a perfect segue for the next slide on, uh, on our troubleshooting methodology. Uh, so, um, so we have a, a series of task cards. So I, I, I wanted to keep 
this slide uh, live, so I'll just maybe talk to you about what we had in mind talking with other airlines we had and talking internally with uh, our groups to how we, we uh, line our stuff. So whenever an event is reported, I guess our the, the priority is to identify the the source. You wanna you wanna know if it comes from the EPU or or what the left or the right engine. So you're able to then make a decision whether you want to fix it or you want to keep flying with it and isolate it. So if you isolate it, you're confident that you'll be able to dispatch the aircraft uh, without any uh, repeat event. Because the repeat event is really, so obviously we don't want, we want, we would like to have zero, but the repeat event on an aircraft, this is when things really go south. And, uh, you know, this is when the issues kind of, uh, increases in, in importance, you know, everybody comes, uh, becomes stressed. And, and so we want to avoid the repeat events uh, as much as possible. So I guess perform efficient troubleshooting and the de decontamination because identifying the source is one thing, but once the aircraft is contaminated, you want to make sure you get rid of the components in the packs that are prone to accumulate oil and also perform the, the right uh, decontamination. So the flow that we've put, uh, the troubleshooting flow that, we're, that we've put in place is first, uh, for every event, we, the crew needs to fill a, a report form. So on the form, there are multiple questions, the phase of flight, the land, the intensity, uh, brief description of the odor, if it's a, a chemical, uh, if it's a uh, dirty sock smell, we know that's what <laughs> engine oil ends up smelling once it's uh, in the cabin. So, um, so there are multiple informations in there and, you know, they cannot not fill one. So we call them back if they haven't filled one. So right now, so it took some time, but now every time there's an event, we get maintenance, we get the form. And then this helps us with our tr troubleshooting because we're able to identify patterns or phases of flight, uh, you know, if that's at the gate, then we'll look for was it a GSC or you know something like that. Um, so the next step then is to uh, identify is to look for the, your main source of odor. So we had some issues with over servicing of the EPU and the engine. That's an easy thing to verify. So this is this is the first thing we ask our maintenance to do. Um, and then we do a GVI of our of the engines. So before tearing down the aircraft, uh, we ask our team to go around the engines, you know, put a flashlight or a black light in the engine. Is there anything obvious in there? Same thing with the EPU, open the doors, look if there's any uh, oil leaks, you know, look at the drains. Uh, so if there's anything obvious there, this is where you're, you'll be able to identify if it's, if you have some glycol events or if it's drenching the oil, then that's an easy, easy finding. And we also do some uh, ground runs to try to replicate the odor. And this is a new procedure we've put in place. I'll, I'll come back right back to it. But uh, I guess the goal is uh, in, before we put the aircraft down for 10 hours and do the full troubleshooting, open up all the packs and whatnot, we want to know if we can re re put this aircraft back in service uh, with either an MEL or with a certain level of confidence that well, maybe that was a brief report by the crew, a 30 seconds report during climb. Well, you know what? We'll put the aircraft back in service and uh, without any MELs and we'll monitor if it repeats. Sometimes it doesn't, maybe it will, but if it does, then that's another, that's another set of information for maintenance to, to do to identify the source and, uh, after. Um, so that's a new procedure we've put in place. We've uh, based this procedure doing the uh, lighter inspection and ground runs based on uh, discussions with some of the North American operators that are a bigger uh, size uh, fleet than Air Canada and, the, and which are more impacted by us uh, than us. So that was really a, a game changer for us because now every time a crew was snagging, uh, whether it was valid or not, quote unquote, we were putting the aircraft down for 12 hours, tearing up everything, replacing um, pack components. So investing a lot of money, putting the aircraft out of service for maybe something where the crew said, 
and you know talking with the crew actually saying well you know we thought it smelled but we're not sure so but well you realize what we just did so uh you know again this was all discussed and agreed between all parties internally at air canada but this has been really a, a game changer in our in our approach to to this uh, issue so again if there's the findings uh, based on this light inspection if we're able to replicate the order on ground that uh, that root cause that uh, that system or if the aircraft is in a proper maintenance condition we have time we have parts we'll just keep it down and we'll do the repair so so in a nutshell this is pretty much the approach that, uh, we, that we're now implementing on every time there's an event that uh, reporting so chris uh, time check are we uh, are we still good yes feel free go ahead continue Perfect. I have uh, two slides left. So, um, so I think it was a Christian that brought the point. So odor sensing devices. Um, maybe I'm not the best advocate for, for, for that. Well, definitely I'm not the best advocate for that. Uh, given, uh, I would say that 95% of the events, we've been able to identify the root cause. Maybe not during the first uh, troubleshooting, but we got better at it based on all the lessons learned uh the the knowledge talking with the oem with the other airlines sharing the best practices and whatnot so uh the investment that we made was really into building some strong internal tools to be able to uh, uh or strong processes to be able to identify those then there are some events and i have them in mind because they've been causing some multiple repeat events, uh, aircraft down for extensive period of time. We, one aircraft, we had to send it to a, a heavy maintenance because we opened up everything on that aircraft. We changed both engines, APU twice and whatnot, but that was like a, a unicorn case. Um, but for some of these very special cases where you inspect everything, you don't find you don't find any source, you put the aircraft back, it repeats, you put it down, you inspect, you don't see anything. We've used tools, uh, odor sensing devices, the Aero Tracer, but some from other vendor as well. Um, we also did work with one of, one of the vendor to, that they were developing there. And in our most complicated cases, they, they came in, they installed their devices, we ran the engine, the APUs, and their, their tool, what we understood is it, it wasn't picking up. It, it, it's good to detect oil odor, but it, it was good to detect quote unquote fresh oil smell. Um, the thing is oil accumulates in certain area of the, of the pack components. And then it waits to have some, it needs some humidity to deploy the, the odor that can be uh, experience or, or smell by, by the, uh, human or even these tools in, in the cabin. So all of that, the, the signature of the smell of the oil, whether it was uh, some oil, oil residues, and it doesn't take much to generate a smell, um, it wasn't picking up the right thing. So all of that to say, you know, we had, it wasn't useful or it didn't work for us. So, uh, so again, I have my doubts on that. Um, but we're not the, we're, I know American Airlines are doing a, a ton of work uh, on, on, on these solutions. So probably they have a different experience. Uh, uh, Lufthansa has definitely a, a different experience. So this is our experience. It hasn't been really a game changer. And the reason, because we've been heavily impacted, this has cost us millions of dollars in engine removal, APUs, AOGs, uh, but we've, elected not to invest money in those devices because we haven't seen really the, uh, the the precision or the consistency in the results or the, the manipulation easiness to uh, with these tools yet. Maybe in the future it will be, but uh, I don't think, we don't see that the technology is ready for us to, to start deploying those tools in, in Air Canada. So that, those are my two cents on those the, uh, other sensing devices. And I guess before we go to the run of questions, so uh, this is my last slide. So I guess I, I think it's just not to repeat too much myself, but the uh, 
most significant action for us at Air Canada was really the uh, troubleshooting instructions, uh, you know, put in place a master task card, which really drives the, the flow, inspect, you know, look for over servicing, inspect the EPU or uh, inspect the engines. If you have this result, do this, uh, go inspect the packs, you know, and this is where we can provide all our best practices, our best recommendations to our maintenance. So, um, we have a set, we have a series of task cards that are all linked to another. So multiple iterations, but I think we've pretty much built something very robust at this point. Uh, sharing best practices with other airlines. Also, this has been a key. Uh, I've learned a lot from American Delta. I've shared my task cards with them. They've shared them with mine. And uh, we've been really be able to increase the knowledge collectively by, by doing all of that. So uh, that, that, that has been key. Also, uh, Airbus, at the beginning, we had some issues with them where, you know, in that meeting in Vegas, but now they're fully on board. Uh, we have a workshop, at least two or, at the beginning, we had think, three workshops per year. Now that things are a bit more under control, we have less. In fact, we have one next month uh, with the North American operators, but uh, but Airbus have built their rig in, uh, um, in uh, Germany to, um, to see what are the best decontaminations, uh, how the pack gets contaminated. Also, they've built a pack there, they're throwing oil in there to see where it accumulates and whatnot. So, so they're fully on board supporting engine and OP, APU OEMs. Um, we, we have to twist their arm a little bit, if I can say like that, to kind of convince them, so, convince them that engines can release oil in, in the aircraft or APU as well, where we were, we are having situations where we had identified the engine, putting it on MEL, no more smell, remove the MEL, it smell, remove the engine, no more smell, send the engine to the shop, and they, they want to return it to us with no faults found. We're like, guys, like, we know it's the engine. No, no, the engine, you know, it's not. So this is this is a, not a battle that is uh, completely over we we still you know every time it's it's a bit uh, difficult to get to this point it's we're we've improved in that situation but uh, this is where we needed really the the help from airbus to really kind of push and uh, on on the oems um and again so maybe a last measure with and we're doing also some preventive actions, doing some steam cleaning of the EPU, things like that. So we're not we're not only reactive. We're investing a lot of money into upgrading parts. Uh, and we're we're built in some actions in our maintenance program as well to uh, uh, to mitigate these issues because um, there are multiple studies out there. Uh, and I guess we need to be careful now after COVID about the studies available, but. You know, studies from Yaza, from you know, great universities saying that the uh, oil is not a safety hazard. It's something that is not pleasant. We certainly don't want to expose our crews and passengers to the, to these uh, situations. So this is why this is something we are taking very seriously, um, and we're constantly uh, looking for new opportunities and uh, new improvement ideas on this topic. So. So I hope I was uh, I, I hope I was clear. So that's pretty much in a nutshell the uh, how Air Canada has been uh, uh, fighting this <laughs> this this uh, cabin air quality uh, uh, battle. Um, so so Chris, I'll, I'll turn it back to you in the room to see if there's any uh, questions or comments uh, before we move on. Thank you, thank you, Francis, very much. Yeah, we have a few people who have uh, raised their hands. So I'll go in order. Uh, Bob from A4A, please. Good morning, Chris and, and all. Thank you very much. And Francis, great presentation, by the way. Uh, from the experience we've heard from our members that are uh, Air Canada plus uh, the US major airlines, uh, you're right on, right on what they're all doing. Um, and of course, JetBlue and American have been right at the forefront. Uh, largely because they're experiencing the same thing with excessive uh, APU changes. I haven't heard so much on engine changes. Uh, I would be curious, uh, I'll go through a couple of things, but I'd be curious for feedback also if uh, Airbus is still pursuing the notion of relocating the APU inlet 
because there was certainly a, 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 a suspicion that a lot was being hoovered up from the, the runways and the taxiways. Um, <clears throat> I want to go towards the sensor side, just kind of give everybody a, a, a sense of what's going on there. Um, we, the U.S. Airlines saw a huge spike in complaints right about the same timeline as we say our Canada there. And we correlate that with also a, a higher efficiency distribution by the labor unions of papers and studies uh, that claim that uh, certain constituents of the engine oil are uh, making people uh, long term ill, possibly even in some cases they're claiming that they've, they've had people die. They call it aerotoxic syndrome. Uh, it has not been recognized by the medical community and it continues to be a moving target. Uh, for a long time, they were saying it was tricrystal phosphate, one of the uh, components in the engine oil. And a study that just came out last year said, well, really not so much. There's not so much of that around. Maybe it's a bunch of other things. And it went through just trying to pick stuff out of the air to see if they could find something that that seemed to explain the situation. Um, but the, the level of emotional involvement from a standpoint of the health, we think has been a big contributor to the rise in the number of complaints. Um, as far as uh, aircraft wise, uh, Boeing sees something on their side, or we saw it in the significant disruption reports, uh, not in APUs, but in air conditioning, specifically recirculator, recirculation fan bearing dis disintegration. Um, there was a conference just last week uh, at uh, Cologne, hosted by IASA, uh, that was talking about where research dollars would next be spent. And once again, the labor unions were there and were not happy with it. The big push from labor right now is to have sensors on the aircraft with displays in the cockpit uh, that would help pilots make decisions about continuation of flight. And uh, that's being very roundly countered right now by uh, airline interests. Uh, a subgroup of an SAE committee is writing a white paper right now to be prepared when the US Congress is faced with these kind of uh, requests as they do the FAA reauthorization bill this year. The white paper is pointing out a couple of things. First of all, that there is no uh, standard out there right now that says what uh, what constituents of engine oil in what concentration over what duration actually pose any kind of a health risk. And you kind of need to know that before you're going to try to decide what you're doing with an with a in-flight situation. Secondly, the, as you've noted in your in your presentation, Francis, the, the sensors are not at a maturity level where you would want to have in-flight displays and actions taken from them. Um, so the SAE committee has been focused on sensors, developing sensor standards that would be for exactly what you're doing, and that's maintenance troubleshooting. Find out if a sensor can uh, detect particular odors that will lead you to a specific maintenance action. Um, that's the way that's trying to go. So I've covered a lot of the waterfront there, but. Uh, Chris Corianis was part of our meeting uh, three weeks ago, I believe, and uh, we want to keep uh, keep contact with everybody here and what the worldwide uh, uh, tenor is of what the uh, what everybody's uh, experiencing. Uh, this isn't going to go away right away, um, and we're particularly concerned in the U.S. that it's going to get legislation behind it uh, by the U.S. Congress. Uh, uh, that body that we all know is made up of air quality experts. <clears throat> <laughs> We're going to try to avoid that. So, over. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thanks for the, your reporting. Uh, Dragos Budeanu, you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Francis, for uh, kindly sharing the insights of, you know, hands on uh, dealing with the issue, which is very important. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, you will have maybe some remarks to share with respect to the A330 events, because I, I've seen that trend of increasing, you know, despite uh, basically that's not corrected, I guess, on, on uh, uh, the amount of flying done and uh, increasing number of events basically on in 2020, 2021, uh, when flying was a bit down, especially on uh, uh, long haul fleet. Uh, any considerations you could share on that one? Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, I guess I, I didn't come back on that. So, on our 330 fleet, and again, we were the so, and I so, we were the only airlines in the world having a 330 issue. So this is 
pretty much a conclusion after all the investigation. I reached out to to all my my uh, colleagues from the uh, 330 fleet. Uh, we also had a 330 symposium with, with uh, all the operators, and I've surveyed the room. Nobody had a 330 spending cabin issue. So it seems like, for some reason, Air Canada, and I think Robert maybe will laugh when I all say that, but it seems like Air Canada were good at being the first one at something. Um, so the main the main root causes for the for the 330. In fact, the other only airline that had issues was American Airlines, but. Uh, the beginning of the pandemic, they exited their H-330 fleet. So, um, so that's a drastic way, uh, a drastic approach of uh, addressing spending cabin. That's not the route we want to go. Um, but the, what we saw is the lower utilization of aircraft, where in, in this era, now we can see it's almost in the past, uh, our 330 were flying in a normal situation, they're flying maybe twice a day on average, but in that period, they were flying maybe once every two days. So, so the lower utilization, the aircraft were staying on ground, the engine windmilling, and this, you know, we know engines are not, are, 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 are the oil system is air pressurized. So it needs bleed air, engine power to pressurize the oil system. So with the windmilling, it doesn't generate enough uh, pressure in the system. So you have all your bearing, bearings leaking, and this was uh, this was the reason why uh, you know lower utilization was resulting into um, uh, a smelling cabin event. So at the towards let's say the well, I guess starting Q3 2022 with the summer. I period I, I utilization ramping up. Uh, we saw really a decrease in the number of events. So we had that feeling based on all the discussions we had with the engine manufacturers, with Airbus, seeing that we were uh, one of the few airlines having some issues with that. So really, that was uh, you know COVID related or low utilization related. However, we do see a lot of issues with the APR. Some issues with the APUs, but I guess it's part of the uh, normal event, but we do have some APU related events. And on the 320 fleet, we had we were one of the on the airline with engine related issues, but that was due to where we were sending our engine to the shop. They changed it, one of the compound for the uh, bearing number three um, installation, and this compound couldn't resist the heat uh, in that area and was disintegrating and. Uh, not doing it, its work and letting oil uh, slip by. So again, we were one of the only one with that issue, but that's why. And APU is the number one culprit for the oil industry with some uh, events related to engine. So that was a long answer, Dragos, but uh, that's uh, 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 that's uh, how we've been uh, it on the 330 side. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. And uh, to be honest, I don't see any other uh, questions. So uh, with this, I will uh, again thank you on behalf of the of the group for your participation. Extremely uh, interesting and, and valuable. Uh, uh, maybe we'll uh, I'll bring you some info. You cannot see the chat uh, notes. There are a few things in the chat that I'll send them over to you. And uh, with this, uh, uh, I will ask uh, uh, our colleague Dragos Munteanu. If Dragos, if you can uh, uh, spend with us a few okay. minutes to give us an update of what happened in that famous IASA meeting that uh, Bob even mentioned earlier. Thanks, Dragos. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I'm just having a few, just a few slides to uh, to introduce to you this workshop that we had. Uh, can you can you tell me, Chris? If yes, this is visible? yes, yes. Go ahead, yeah. please. So. Basically, as as in the Americas, the the subject of cabin air quality is high on the agenda in in Europe, and it's a it's a constant presence. You, uh, you may remember that I have uh, updated you uh, some some time ago, maybe more than a year, regarding some works that uh, on the standardization side, what SEN, which is the European Committee for Standardization, let's say part of of ISO. They were doing, and uh, this uh, lobby of the aerotoxic syndrome was in fact pushing for a, a standard 
uh, exactly as related to, to what uh, what was mentioned before, installation of sensors, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, un, unrealistic things that in fact they were pushing towards through a non-aviation entity, SEN. Luckily, that was not resulted in standard, that was, did not result in a technical specification, only into a technical report, which still is a, is a nuisance, which still is, a, is an issue that in fact is a document uh, with the recommendations, but it has the logo of, of SEN. Um, in the aviation world, EASA has been, um, has been working in fact for, uh, for many years um, on studies, and I realize this, I'm displaying slide too, so in fact this is my, my first slide. Uh, they've been working for many years in studying the subject and they've been quite uh, objective in trying to understand what is behind the cabin air quality events and basically try to, to, uh, to do research to validate and to evaluate the problem, so quite objectively. And um, the previous studies that were released in 2017, they had quite um, very positive, in fact, results and, and conclusions. And I've put there in the um, uh, in the last bullet, just extracted from uh, one of the executive summaries. Uh, that basically, in 2017, they were saying that the results showed that cabin cockpit air quality is similar or better than what is observed in normal indoor environments. And then, no occupational limits and guidelines were exceeded. Uh, of course, we we realized this when when we discussed about when we put all the pressure on regarding COVID and then we understood the better and I, we hope also that the media and the public understood how uh, often the uh, the air is being exchanged and really it, its quality shouldn't be shouldn't be in fact questioned but this lobby of the aerotoxic syndrome is uh, is very strong um, in Europe and this is why uh, EASA fortunately continues with the research evolving a little bit the scenarios and on, on, on this slide, I'm presenting to you the study which is undergoing and is happening right now, right in this period. And the workshop was just by scientists in order to, to um, uh, explain basically how the science will be, uh, how in fact that they will do this, this research. And the title of the project, the, the scope of the project is cabin air quality assessment of long-term effects of contaminants. So basically, again, trying to validate if there, is, there are long-term health effects. And um, they are really focusing on oil. Yeah, it's been mentioned already in the call. So basically that the objective is to enable advances in the analysis of the issues raised by contamination resulting from, from oil. And in fact, they will their scientists will be using only one type of oil in their research. This is the, 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 the one that I'm sure many airlines are using the mobile, the mobile brand. And then, basically, based on the studies, the these studies they will just try to understand if there is any limitations being uh, being developed. What is different in the studies before? Real aircraft have been used, and the scientists realize that these events are so rare that uh, using real aircraft is not really the uh, the the way to go. You because they would need a large number of aircraft and a long period of time, and the, the, the research will just cost in a lot of money trying to find that fume event and then try to, to understand it uh, completely. So basically now what they are doing, it's at the research lab. So really trying to recreate fume events in laboratory, in um, in uh, research, uh, in, uh, in research facilities and including um, animal testing, which is uh, quite uh, shocking maybe for some, but it's still possible in, in certain scenarios with with the proper approvals. So basically they will use mice, which will be in fact subject to various concentrations of uh, of oil. And uh, these concentrations will be in fact studied to see and then to if if the, the health of the subjects is being uh, is being affected. In terms of the consortium, who is in this consortium? Airbus is there, Safran is there. Uh, we have uh, a lot of um, we, a lot of uh, occupational uh, state occupational um, agencies based in Europe, from from Germany, from the Netherlands, from from Denmark. So basically, in terms of the the constituents of the consortium, I don't I don't think that we can object of their uh, of their science 
position and their on, on their tenure. So ASA was, I think, quite careful to to choose, and the consortium that is uh, that is being chosen is cannot be uh, accused of uh, subjectivity or of lack of uh, of possibilities in terms of, uh, of of their research. So their background is is quite strong. And on this slide is just I'm not go into into the the bullet is basically how from the uh, the tests uh, that will uh, will will use in fact the, uh, the the mice the results will be in fact run through toxicology uh, in toxicology tests so basically at the end there will be some some conclusions being being in fact drawn the the real test will happen um, this spring but then there will be quite a long time that the scientists will dedicate to i do in fact the numbers and the data that will they will obtain to uh, to try to standard to somehow interpret it and then basically publish uh, some initial recommendations and well initial conclusions i would say what we have seen and it was already mentioned is that the event was quite uh, i would say uh, very similar to going to a congressional hearing if you want the scientist was somehow put against the wall by the um, Staff associations representative because yes we talk about this aerotoxic lobby, but in fact the the, the persons that were in, that were in fact representing this lobby were mainly from the uh, the pilot unions, cabin crew unions, and uh, an association, an organization that you may have uh, heard of, GCQAE, and uh, two uh, two names that also you may have heard, Captain Tristan Lorraine and Dr. Susan Michaelis. So these these are per the the persons that you always uh, hear about regarding this uh, this 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 topic aerotoxic there is, there is a, a conference that they organize yearly so a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, these issues are taken by by the media and we also receive a lot of uh, media requests of commenting regarding the subject up until now our position has been quite clear that basically we are not against research but we are again we are for a research that is uh, is objective basically uh, also stating that the lots of efforts that the airlines are doing in understanding this these uh, these events unfortunately the, uh, the 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 persons present in the in the workshop started questioning the science the scientists uh, had their own conclusions or their own mindset trying to to impose and at a certain point the scientists and the asa had to stop them and to tell them we are at the we didn't start the research so there is no we cannot talk about conclusions when the research has not started and you cannot impose any kind of preconceived conclusions on scientists because that's our job we know how to to, to do science we know how to do research and basically the data and the the, the conclusions will, will speak for themselves at the end of the study and not before it so it was quite a quite a tense uh, the tense atmosphere but as I, I believe managed it quite well what's coming up so basically the research will happen uh, for 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 this year and then uh, another workshop for sure will be organized by by EASA and some final reports i estimate that we may have another workshop in a year from now and the final report may be towards the end of 2024 and of course that report based on its recommendation will be used in for various measures that we cannot anticipate now and what we are doing is we are updating you. We are, have updated already other groups in IAT after, for instance, the flight operation group. And then clearly as, uh, as A4A, we are constantly monitoring and ramping up our activities to understand better what is happening and to be ready, in fact, to uh, to comment and to represent the industry. On And yes, this topic is not going away. It's unfortunately something that we need to, uh, to, to follow in the next uh, years. And... Um, really protect the industry. That's all, uh, in fact, Chris, for uh, for Thank my you. side. Thank you. Thank you, Dragos. Any questions for Dragos? OK, there are no questions, so I'll move on with uh, uh, Dragos uh, Budeanu. Any any updates from your end? Uh, we have just a few minutes, so if you if you have any, if you can be short, it will be appreciated. Not really, Chris. Uh, I mean, uh, things have been mentioned by by Bob and uh, Dragos Montano, so nothing substantial to add there. 
It's just the fact that uh, we want to convey the message that we're taking this very seriously uh, between, you know, scientific and academic studies in a way in the lab environment, which uh, uh, Dragos Montana mentioned, uh, we'll see the uh, final report coming out and the hands-on troubleshooting, which uh, Francis uh, kindly gave us a snapshot from uh, from Air Canada side. There's uh, a, a largely encompassing uh, area and uh, we are on board uh, with it. Uh, we have to distinguish between the real facts uh, and the the theoretical and the noise from public perception. And uh, we still hold dear the idea that the maturity level uh, is not there and uh, for installing on the aircraft devices that would be uh, aircraft installed and trigger basically different procedures in terms of operations here. So we have to follow up and carefully monitor and uh, act uh, according to that uh, maturity evolution. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Drago. Stuart, you have a question? Yeah, good uh, good presentations and some good feedback, Bob. What's the latest on this letter that I know is going to be uh, is being drafted in opposition to that um, bill that's proposed in the USA? Uh, uh, Stuart, um, uh, Bob had to leave the call. Oh. I think he put in the chat that uh, he left the call about uh, 10 minutes ago. Okay, so, so we, 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 we need to ask him separately, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Uh, so, uh, that's, I don't see any other questions. So, uh, that's the end. And uh, I think, Geraldine, you can stop the recording here. And uh, 